Well, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, as was said, I'm a, a cardiologist working in Edinburgh, but I also spend some time researching um, and uh, have been researching the effects of air pollution, particularly on the heart, over the last few years. Um, and more recently, I'm a member of the uh, UK Government Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollution, which is a government advisory panel which hopefully uh, transmits some of this into policy. Um, so I'm going to talk predominantly about cardiovascular health. Um, everyone, when you think about air pollution, which you're breathing into your lungs, may think of respiratory health first of all, and I'm hopefully going to convince you that the heart is more important. Um, so we'll, but this is not a new idea, okay? And this chap here, uh, is John Evelyn. John Evelyn was born in uh, 1620, I believe, was a contemporary of Samuel Pepys and was one of the founder members of the Royal Society. Um, and he wrote this document called Fumifugium, um, which he presented to King Charles II uh, in 1660 something, um, in which he said that 50% of the deaths in London at the time were because of poor air quality. Um, now, he had some fairly radical solutions. He suggested everyone should move to Paris or plant lots of trees. Um, now, that may have some effect. Um, it's perhaps not quite practical. Um, so, we've known that air quality is important for health for a long time. Perhaps at that point, they didn't really understand what it was in the air that was bad. And I think over the years, we've become fairly focused on that. And there's now a good body of evidence that shows uh, what it is in the air that's bad for you and why it's bad for you. And the thing that focused attention, really, within the UK was this episode here. And these are archive footages from the BBC. Um, and this is middle of the day in London uh, in December 1952, when there was a, a well-documented temperature inversion. So it was very cold. Uh, the air was very still. And at the time, there was lots of heavy industry burning lots of coal. And the air got trapped underneath this cold temperature inversion. And smoke levels within the city rose very, very rapidly. Um, to the point where there were people leading buses, as you saw, with torches, because the, the visibility was so poor. And this is interesting because it's really well documented. And this, this rise in smoke was documented and measured as a black carbon, essentially, or smoke in the air. And over that period in December, you can see this blue line here is smoke. And you can see that the concentration of smoke in the air rose very dramatically over what would be a normal baseline level. Interestingly, along with that, there appeared to be a spike in deaths. And over those few days there, about 3,000 extra people died um, from cardiac and respiratory conditions that would otherwise have been expected over that time. And it's actually estimated that over a three-month period, about 12,000 extra people died just because of that one-week spike in air pollution. So this really focused attention, and in the UK led to the, the, the introduction of the Clean Air Act in 1952, which followed this, um, and which has had a major impact on the quality of air. And I, I hope none of you have seen air quality like this within the UK, although that does happen in other parts of the world. So what is air pollution? Well, of course, air pollution is many different things. As uh, Kate said, with water pollution, it's not one thing. There are many things that are contributing to what is in the air. And these are just some of the things that we might think of as being uh, involved in producing air pollution. It's road traffic. This is a photograph I took in Beijing when I was doing some studies. It's uh, other sources of transport, uh, forest fires, power stations. This is Saharan dust, which was in the news not long ago in London uh, for causing uh, large amounts of air pollution. But within what we think of as air pollution, there are many different bits. And if we look at it in more detail, really it's made up of a combination of things, either all joined together or in mixtures. And there are gases such as nitrogen dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Um, there are organic compounds, like Kate alluded to earlier on, um, which presumably is what is being leached into our water. Uh, um, there are transition metals and heavy metals that again come uh, along with these particles. But perhaps the most important um, thing for health is particulate air pollution. Um, and these are the little tiny fine particles that are suspended in the air that we breathe in. Okay. And these particles are very small. Okay. So this is, uh, these are particles that are 
uh, blown up on scale, if you like. And when we talk about particulate air pollution in the air, there are a couple of conventions that we talk about. You come across these things called PM10, PM2.5, ultrafine particles. It really all means the same thing. But what it is, is based on size. So PM10 are particles with a mean aerodynamic of less than 10 micrometers. PM2.5 is less than 2.5 micrometers, and ultrafine particles are, are, are generally recommended to be less than 100 nanometers in size. So that's the sort of size that we're looking at. And if we think about PM10 particles, you can see that it's very much smaller than a human hair, PM2.5 even much smaller than that. So these are very, very tiny, and clearly we can't see them. And why is that important? Well, particles that are this small evade our natural clearance. Okay, so we breathe things in, we have uh, uh, hairs and things in our nose that help to filter out these, um, these particles and, and prevent things from getting down into the lungs. But these are so small, they get carried with the air deep down into our lungs. Um, and this is a blown up electron micrograph of a lung. Okay, so this is, this is lung, and this white bit here is air space, so that's where air is going to be. These are the cells that form the alveoli, the air sacs at the bottom of the lung. And then this sort of fairly insipid colour should have been red because that's blood vessels. And you can see how close blood vessels come to reaching to, to air and of course to these tiny particles that get carried deep down into your lung. So it's not difficult to see why these things might be having an effect on health, whether in the lung itself or whether in the bloodstream. So we already talked about this sort of natural experiment that said air pollution is bad for you from London. These are two of the real key landmark studies um, that have documented this association between particulate air pollution and cardiovascular health. Okay? Um, this is from uh, 1993, um, and this was, it was called the Harvard Six Cities Study. And what the investigators did was look at people that live within six US cities spread across the US, each of which had a very different background level of air pollution from different sources. Uh, and they looked at the people's residents' risk of dying, if you like, from heart disease uh, over a long period of time. This was the American Cancer Cohort Study, which was really set up to look at the incidence of different cancers. Um, and they looked at um, death rates over time of a million people living within the US and looked at their long-term exposure to air pollution. And this is the sort of headline graph, really, from the Six Cities study. Each of these letters represents a different city uh, within the, the US. Um, and within each city, there was obviously a range of ambient air pollution levels. Um, and this was the relative risk of heart attacks or dying of uh, cardiovascular disease. And it's pretty clear that if you live in a higher polluted city, your risk of dying from a cardiovascular event is higher. And the American Cancer Cohort study put numbers on that in terms of a linear scale. And they said for each 10 microgram per meter cubed increase in PM2.5, that's equivalent to living in Edinburgh to a year, to living in London for a year. That's the sort of difference that you'd expect there. Your risk of dying from a cardiovascular event goes up by about 6%. Given that cardiovascular disease is the UK's biggest killer, these are big numbers. Okay. Cardiovascular disease in the UK was thought to result in about 180,000 deaths in 2010. These were the statistics I got from the British Heart Foundation yesterday. And each year, it's thought there were about 103,000 episodes of heart attack, 152,000 strokes, which are, of course, related in terms of the, what the, the underlying disease process, and about 25,000 new cases of heart failure. And like Kate with her staggering figure for uh, water pollution, this is an estimate from the Global Burden of Diseases study which said that exposure to urban ambient air pollution, that's us walking along the streets, um, is estimated to result in about three and a half million deaths worldwide. That does not include indoor air pollution from burning of biomass and cooking, which probably contributes to about another three and a half million people. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'm going to focus purely on the ambient air pollution. But these are big numbers. As a cardiologist, uh, dealing with heart attacks every day, then I'm going to talk about heart attacks, which are sort of the biggest killer within the cardiovascular group, if you like. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what, uh, what, what a heart attack is and how air pollution may affect each of the steps along the way of you having a heart attack. 
So hopefully my video is going to work. What causes a heart attack? Well, over time, deposits of cholesterol move into the wall of the arteries of the heart and a plaque develops. With time, the plaque gets bigger and eventually cells move into the plaque and make it inflamed. This process weakens the wall of the plaque and predisposes it to rupturing. And when that happens, a blood clot forms on the surface of the rupture. This can eventually block off the artery so that the muscle that is beyond that artery is starved of oxygen and blood and eventually dies. Okay, so that's what causes a heart attack. It's this um, process of um, developing an atherosclerotic plaque, which we call coronary artery disease, which then gets complicated by uh, plaque rupture and thrombus formation and eventually causes heart attacks. And of course, heart attacks then go on to, uh, to kill us. So how can air pollution cause heart attacks? You're breathing this stuff into your lungs. How does that work? The key underlying process here was this process of atherosclerosis, from a normal blood vessel at the top to this deposits of cholesterol within the wall of the artery. And it's not just cholesterol, it's complex stuff. It's lots of inflammatory things going on, lots of inflammatory cells. This can be quite unstable and, and, and lead on to cause trouble. And of course, if it's just narrowing the lumen, this is what causes angina, and if it ruptures, this is what causes a heart attack. This is, um, this is a, a map of air pollution levels in Los Angeles in America. Uh, and this was produced by uh, a chap called Nino Kunzli, who is a scientist working in Bern, I think, in Switzerland. And what they did was look at uh, people living in Los Angeles uh, and looked at their background exposure to air pollution over long periods of time based on where they lived and the local monitoring levels and then measured the development of this atherosclerotic plaque. And the way they did that was ultrasound scanning of the neck because plaque can form in lots of blood vessels. Um, and one of the places it forms in the neck and you can see that quite nicely. And they showed that as your background exposure to particular air pollution goes up, your plaque burden goes up, you're more likely to develop plaque in these coronary arteries. And they then, well this is carotid arteries but we can think of that as a, uh, an arterial system as a whole. They then went on to do some really nice work that actually studied these patients again later on and showed that not only is it associated with more plaque at baseline, it also appears to be associated with progression of plaque and the plaque getting more prominent, um, which is clearly very important for the development of uh, cardiovascular events. So air pollution can cause atherosclerosis or can worsen atherosclerosis. Now, Looking at atherosclerosis takes a long time. It builds up over many, many years. And what we've been doing and other groups around the world is looking at more short-term exposures to air pollution. Now, the problem with air pollution is that it's very um, difficult. It changes from day to day. So in order to study that, we need some way of doing that. And this is our test setup in Sweden that we use to do controlled exposures to air pollutants. And what you saw there was a truck engine burning standard diesel. Um, from which we take a small portion of the exhaust, mix it with high volumes of air and introduce it into this whole body chamber so that we can model air pollution based, uh, you know, urban air pollution like diesel exhaust um, very, very carefully. Uh, and then we can do experiments on people uh, to see what effects it has on the cardiovascular system or whatever other system we might be interested in. Um, and we can study these patients when they're not exposed to diesel or when they're exposed to air, and we can look at these differences in effects. So this is what I've been doing for the last few years. This was a medical student who uh, volunteered his time. So what's been known from all of these studies? Well, we talked about atherosclerosis building up, and then Mark Dweck told us about um, these uh, atherosclerotic plaques rupturing and then forming blood clot, which blocks off the artery. So is there evidence that air pollution can affect these things. Well, we don't, we don't always understand what it is that causes rupture of a plaque, but it is definitely associated with things like changes in blood pressure, um, physical exertion, anger, I like that one. Um, and air pollution has been shown in the short term to increase blood pressure. So there's no doubt that it can cause spikes in blood pressure. So as your exposure goes up, your blood pressure goes up, and that could predispose to plaque rupture. And that's not impossible. There was a really nice study from uh, Annette Peters, who works in Germany, and she looked at about 700 people that came into hospital with a heart attack and said, 
think back, what were you doing for the last 72 hours? And they went back hour by hour over 72 hours prior to them coming into hospital. And they found that patients were three times more likely to have been in traffic immediately before their heart attack coming on, the symptoms of heart attack coming on, than at other times. And they said that maybe, maybe it's uh, triggering heart attacks. And there's now been some other evidence to say that it can do that. So this is causing this plaque rupture. And this is an analysis from uh, Tim Navarrot that was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, looking at all those known triggers for having a heart attack or initiating the first step of heart attack. And whilst exposure to traffic-derived air pollution in terms of its magnitude of risk is relatively small, so each increment gives you a small increase in risk, because every single one of us is exposed to air pollution, we have no choice whether we're exposed or not. On a population level, this becomes the most important trigger for developing the myocardial infarction across a population. So this isn't a small effect, this is the most important trigger in the population. Okay? So it's, it's spending time in, in, in traffic. So yes, it can cause this plaque rupture, it can cause heart attacks to develop. So once the plaque's ruptured, we form this blood clot on the surface. Can air pollution affect with this blood clotting mechanism? Well, the thing that causes blood clot is these little circulating cells called platelets. They're a nice purple colour here. They're not purple inside you, but they're a nice purple colour in this diagram. And what happens is these platelets come along and they stick to this ruptured area of plaque and try to heal it, if you like. But that causes blood clot to form. And it's been shown in these controlled exposure studies that after exposure to air pollution, your platelets are wound up. They're more likely to stick. They're more likely to develop or to cause clot to develop. And that if we measure clot development in a model of uh, arterial injury, we can see that after exposure to diesel exhaust, your clot burden goes up. So you are more likely to develop blood clot or more blood clot if you've been exposed to traffic-derived air pollution. So this blood clot forms in the artery, okay? And your artery starts to get lack of blood downstream, if you like. This is a coronary angiogram, an x-ray test of the heart arteries that was done in the context of a heart attack. This is one of the arteries on the right-hand side of the heart, and we can see this nice black area here, and then this uh, area of narrowing, which is what a blood clot looks like on an angiogram. And this is blood clot that's formed in the artery, causing the patient to have a heart attack. And if the blood clot starts to form, your body tries to fight that. And what it does is it releases these chemicals that break down blood clot, to try and dissolve that clot, to try and get blood back down to the heart. And it's been shown that exposure to air pollution impairs that ability to break down blood clot. So not only do you form more clot, you can't break it down either. So it's more likely to cause you to go on to have a heart attack. And you can see that this clot is starting to narrow the lumen of the artery, less blood's getting past, that's why people go on to have heart attack and heart injury. So the natural response of the blood vessel is to try and dilate and get bigger, to try and get more blood flow down to the heart. And after air pollution, you can't do that either. So not only does it rupture plaque, causes formation of clot, it also impairs those adaptive mechanisms and explains perhaps why patients might go on to have heart attacks. And it's not a one-way street. So I already talked about atherosclerosis, this initial burden of plaque, if you like, that's causing the trouble. Well, the first step in developing plaque is abnormal function of the blood vessels. So it's a bit of a cycle, really. So we can see how this kind of perpetuates, and air pollution is obviously uh, important at all those points. So exposure to particular air pollution. And when I'm talking about particular air pollution, the links are strongest for particles derived from combustion of fossil fuel, particularly from traffic sources. So it's things like diesel exhaust, it's things like power stations, it's industrial things that are burning fossil fuels. It increases morbidity and mortality from cardiac diseases. It increases the formation and progression of atheromas of plaque. It triggers heart attacks you know, by increasing blood clot formation, impairing those adaptive mechanisms. And there is some evidence that it may uh, increase cardiac arrhythmia. And of course, heart attacks, patients tend to die of cardiac arrhythmia first, if you like, before they get to hospital. Once we get there, we can do something about it. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you that air pollution is not good for your heart. Um, 
I could have talked about respiratory disease. There are lots of links to other respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD. And there's actually a very strong link to lung cancer. I'm, not, I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but we'll focus on one thing for today. So what I wanted to just talk about briefly towards the end of the talk is, well, what can we do about it? So Kate showed us some nice things that we can do about uh, water pollution. And, you know, we can treat water before it comes to the houses. What can we do about air pollution? Well, this is a difficult challenge because with economic development in the developing world, of course, there's this need for industrial expansion and burning more fuel to, to, to fuel this economic expansion. And of course, that's going to increase air pollution levels. And controls on air pollution are challenging economically, politically, and on a personal level. But there is some precedent for this. This is Dublin, for those of you who don't recognise it. And in the 1990s, Dublin banned the sale of bituminous coal, which was used at that point to heat all domestic houses, it was used very heavily in industry, and they banned the sale. Overnight, air quality improved by about 35%. So it made a big difference in terms of the amount of particles within the air. And corresponding to that, there was a big reduction in heart attacks. So it was about a 20% reduction in heart attacks over the next year. And that's a pretty big improvement. And similar things have been shown for cigarette smoking. So all of you know that there was a cigarette ban or in public places here in uh, Scotland in 2007, 2008, I think. Um, and with the introduction of the smoking ban, one year later, the incidence of heart attacks in the general population went down by 17%. That's not just smokers, that's everyone. And in fact, the, the effect was even higher in people that weren't smokers, about 21% reduction in those that weren't smokers. So policy level interventions can make a big difference, okay. but they are challenging. Now, there are some pretty strict guidelines. Uh, we are uh, limited by the EU guidelines. This is the EU target level for daily levels of PM 2.5 air pollution, okay? 25 micrograms per meter cubed. The World Health Organization would like us to move towards 10 micrograms per meter cubed. I can tell you most places in Europe are meeting this. Almost nowhere is meeting this. And this is down the road, Edinburgh, St. Leonard's. This is PM 2.5 air pollution that was measured over the last week, up until last night when I put this slide together. And the dotted line is the World Health Organization recommended limit. So you can see that over the last week, we've clearly exceeded the World Health Organization target for air pollution, but we're well within the EU limits. Does that matter? Well, it does matter. And there doesn't appear to be a threshold for, it, uh, for the health effects of these particles. You can see it at any level. So there is no safe level, if you like. So this is having an effect, even though we're, we're you know, within the European limits. So policy levels of interventions are pretty large scale and challenging. Are there more individual things that we can do? This is a particle filter on your car. Anyone that's bought a diesel car in the last few years will have one of these things on the car. And there is some evidence that this reduces local levels of particulate air pollution. And we have shown in our controlled exposure studies that if you put these particles filters in line with the diesel exhaust, we can get rid of those health effects. But of course, it only has a limited effect because not every car is going to have one of these on and there are other sources of particulate air pollution. But this may have an effect. The problem is it may move the effect because these filters currently regenerate themselves by burning off what's kept in there. Um, and what it probably does is move things out of the city centre and onto big highways where you get a big cloud of black smoke as these things uh, renew. I've put fuels on there. Um, there may be other uh, fuel sources that we can look at. Hydrogen fuel, of course, is pretty clean at the point of burning. Um, hybrid engines, there's lots of things that are being done to try and improve the emissions from, from cars, and they may have an effect on health, although we don't know, yet know that. What can you do? Well, the best thing you can do is to get out on your bike and stay away from major roads, okay? So this is London, and this is air pollution level within central London. Uh, red is obviously higher levels than, than blue, and you can see that the, the levels of particulate air pollution really follow those major highways. So if you want to be, uh, reduce your exposure, stay away from those major highways. Get on your bike, go through the park. And of course, getting on your bike is good for your health anyway, and, and probably, um, and the, 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 the effects, if you like, to an individual of cycling in traffic, because I get asked this question all the time, right? So should I cycle in traffic or should I not? Um, 
cycling in traffic will obviously increase your exposure to particulate air pollution, which will increase your risk of having a heart attack. But the converse is that cycling is really good for you and will reduce your risk of having a heart attack. Get on your bike, it's much safer, okay? On an individual level. But on a population level, that's important, okay? <coughs> Try and use other things. I'll put Edinburgh tram on. It's got to be good for something. <laughs> <laughs> so, air pollution is detrimental to cardiovascular health. Policy level uh, interventions are needed but challenging. We can all play a part. Perhaps there's a role for alternative fuels, filtration uh, things, perhaps using active transport, staying away from uh, big busy roads, using public transport and of course we can't do anything about air pollution on an individual level but we can look after all the other things. So from a cardiologist's point of view, please don't smoke, do lots of exercise. Okay. <laughs>